Welcome to the Bold Life Movement Podcast. I'm your host, Kimberly Rich, and each week I bring you inspiring stories from real people to help you live a more passionate and intentional life. You'll learn how to up-level in everything from relationships, entrepreneurship and leadership, to spirituality, sexuality, and yes, even money. If you're interested in raising your game to be a better business owner, a better lover, and a happier, more fulfilled human, then you're in the right place. No more living on autopilot. You are just an episode away from a bolder, better, more fulfilling life. Welcome to episode 76. Today I have with me world record holder, author, and speaker, Roz Savage coming on the show. Roz, thank you so much for coming on the show. I know we've been trying to connect for a while and I'm really, really excited to share your story with my listeners. So thank you so much for being on The Bold Life. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you. So I know that I've read up on you, you know, your story's incredible, but I want to give my listeners like a little bit of background information. You come from a consulting, very corporate background and at some point decided, F it, I'm going to go to Peru, take an adventure. So how did those, you know, what was the sequence of those events that led you from consulting to Peru to crossing the Atlantic? Give us a little bit of the background. Um, I think that I had been aware um, over the last few years of the 11 years I was a management consultant that I was not thriving in that environment. Yeah. it just, um, in fact, even worse than that, I sort of felt like my soul was being destroyed. I can remember that phrase actually popping into my mind one morning as I stood on the platform at the train station waiting to catch the train to work. And there was this real sense of, I have to get out of here while I can still remember who I am. Mm. And what really brought it home to me that I was uh, maybe chasing the wrong rainbow was this exercise that I did one night. Uh, it must have been a particularly bad day in the office. It was inspired by Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Mm-hmm. And one of the seven habits is begin with the end in mind. So he suggests that you imagine that you're at your own funeral and mm. you write two different versions. What do you want people to be saying about you? And what will they actually say about you if you carry on as you are? And I realized then that um, this rainbow that I've been chasing, you know, I totally bought into the 1980s materialistic myth that having the big house, and the nice holidays and the fast car, I thought all that was going to make me happy. Yeah. But you know what? When I was writing what I wanted people to be saying about me at my funeral, it was nothing to do with what I owned, obviously. Right. It was going to be to do with, you know, how I lived boldly, um, how I got out there and, um, you know, really lived the heck out of life, how I hopefully left the world a slightly better place, how I was a good friend, um, Mm. generous and supportive. It was about all of these completely non-materialistic things. And so I think there was sort of this combination of sort of horror that, oh my God, like for the last 11 years, in fact, even longer than that, since my teenage years, I'd really been chasing that dream only to realize that was not what was going to lead to a worthwhile life. Yeah. Um, And sort of embarrassment of, I'm going to have to do a really big, like... I'm going to have to make some big changes, here. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to make some really big changes. Um, so it took me a bit longer before um, I really made those changes. And I think some of the changes were more subconscious than conscious because what it really involved was letting go of everything that had represented security mm. to me. Um, my job my husband, I was curious about my that. home, <laughs> mm. uh, my home, my income. I mean, there was a lot of um, what would have been really scary if I'd actually had the courage to do it proactively. But I think it was it happened more subconsciously um, that I just sort of managed to sabotage everything. Um, and I think sometimes we do that for a reason. Yeah. So I ended up like with none of these things that had represented security. I was just like free as a bird. Um, I'm sure my mum and dad and my friends thought it was a complete train wreck, but actually 
it was incredibly liberating because yeah. I'd been so good at jumping through other people's hoops. You know, I was good at passing exams. I went to Oxford and got a law degree and I, I got all the pats on the back. And those pats on the back can become very addictive. Totally. That instead of doing the things you want to be doing with your life, you end up doing the things that will make other people say, nice job, well done. <laughs> which is completely bonkers when you when you look back at it like yeah. that but um but at the time I mean I think a lot of people fall into that trap I know I certainly did oh for sure we, yeah. so when you I read on your website that when you did go to Peru you sat with ayahuasca can I ask you about that <laughs> I wish there was more to tell um yeah <laughs> Definitely at this stage of my life where I was very, very open to new experiences. And, you know, I certainly never tried any mind altering substances before. Yeah. And I think that I hoped it would be a kind of shortcut to enlightenment. You know, I dreamt about sting going into the Amazon and, you know, having this amazing sort of cosmic experience. Yeah. So I traveled for four days up the Amazon um, on a very low budget, um, had some of my stuff stolen along the way. Went and met the shaman That's and his deal. family, and we all sat round one evening, taking the ayahuasca, and you know what? Absolutely nothing happened. No! I <laughs> know, I was so disappointed. Did you only do it the one night? Um, I only did it the one night, and oh, so okay. I don't know. You sound like you know about this. Well, I have friends. I've never done it, but I'm feeling more and more called to it. And I've never even experimented with any mind altering substance like that. So uh, I'm curious whenever I meet someone who I know has tried it, I want to know about their experience. And so my friends who have done it, they explain that typically there's multiple nights in a row that you sit with it. And Yeah, um, I've heard about certain um, weekends when it's typically two nights. Yeah. Um, so I... Um, was there with people who'd taken ayahuasca. I mean, they were the shaman's family. Like, they yeah. <laughs> don't know how often they take this, but it was certainly not their first time. Yeah. So I, I have heard that maybe it's more of a sort of cumulative effect that you sort of flip into that mode more easily when you've already taken that journey a few times before. Yeah. Um, they all seem to be getting dramatic results. I was just sitting there going, any time now would be good. Yeah. Um, well, so, it sounds like an experience nonetheless. I mean, sitting in the Amazon with a with a shaman when months earlier you're in London, you know, on a train. Yeah, yes, yeah, so it was certainly a big step in the right direction. And I think yeah. maybe um, going to Peru, you know, is a mind altering experience in yeah. itself. I mean, forget the ayahuasca. And especially because just before I went there, I'd read um, the Celestine Prophecy. Okay. A few, I, haven't, it's, I haven't heard of that. It describes a spiritual novel. So it introduces certain spiritual ideas, but through the through a fictional vehicle. Yeah, oh, I would love that. It's actually set in Peru. Okay. And um, the main ideas that I took away from it were um, that there's no such thing as coincidence. Like everything is sort of an opportunity. Just... And also, <laughs> um, also about... Uh, conversations as being an exchange of energy but you know really everything is about energy yeah and just because we can't see it doesn't mean it isn't there so I was really experimenting with this well, I was so excited with this radically new worldview that I'd yeah. never encountered before and you know now there are quite a lot of books around that um, central concept um, but I was I think when you travel, it's a really good opportunity to try putting on a different pair of glasses on the world, like looking 100%. at reality through different lenses and just going, well, if this were true, would my life be better, worse or the same? Yeah. And I found that my life felt very magical, very exciting. Um, so I was like, I'll stick with this worldview, I think. I like this one. Yeah, well, so. one of the reasons that we rescheduled recently is because the time difference was off. I was in Bali, and that was an extremely last-minute trip. It felt like the entire time I was there, it was all magic, you know, and yeah. so, much, so many conversations about energy, and I happened to have like three extremely good friends all separate there at the same time. It was coincidences but like they I don't believe in that so um it was really 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 
I don't know, nourishing in, in a very spiritual way. So I can, I can get on board. That book sounds amazing. We'll definitely have it linked up in the show notes for sure. Yeah, it came out ages ago now, but certainly for me, it was a, a very good gateway into this whole sort of spiritual realm. Yeah. And that was really something that um, had not, not been a part of my life as a management consultant. But as yeah. I was going through really this massive personal reinvention in my sort of early to mid 30s, um, I a bunch Sorry, of Matt. really interesting <laughs> new friends. Yeah, it's... Um, Certainly for me, it was when I really started asking those big existential questions about who am I? What am I here for? I, I like to think that um, youngsters like you now are like that much further ahead of where I was at your age that I think yeah. um, a lot of these ideas that I certainly hadn't encountered earlier are now more of the cultural water that we swim in yeah it, it does feel like those existential questions are being asked earlier and becoming introspective is becoming more mainstream versus 20 yeah. years ago yes um and yeah i suppose i carried on for a while getting more and more introspective um Actually, it's interesting. I've just started working with uh, the gene keys, as in genetics, yeah. it, um, by Richard Rudd. And um, my life's work is being, and it talks about having to go through the self-obsession stage, if only to realize that ultimately there is no self, mm -hmm. that actually we're all one, yeah. and then to emerge into naturalness. And the way that the book described it, I was just going, this has just described my life's journey. Uh, so, I, But I think it's really the same journey for, for all of us who choose to ask those questions yeah. and seek answers. Well, I definitely want to get into how your life has changed since doing The Crossings, but... The crossings are so interesting that I do want to um, spend some time on those. So can sure. you tell me what was the decision point where you were like, you know, because you grew up as a rower, you rowed in, in university, but did you not? Yes. Did I get that right? Uh, no, you did. You did absolutely get that right. I, I was just uh, pulling a face at the growing up bit because <laughs> when I was at school, I was a disaster like, at physical Who education. Was it? <laughs> I was, well... <laughs> I felt like I was more disastrous than most even. I was, because um, I was this sort of geeky bookworm, um, I was a year ahead of my age. Okay. So like, I was with bigger kids. Yeah. And um, I just never really developed any talent for ball sports whatsoever. And most, in most British schools, ball sports are what girls do, like netball, hockey, yeah. tennis. And I was hopeless at all of those. So to my mind, I'd sort of written myself off as, as a bit athlete. of a sporting dunce. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yes, I, you're right. I did start rowing when I went to university. So, and, and I actually found to my great surprise that I was quite good at it, probably because it didn't involve a ball. Fair enough. But yes. being good at something and deciding to do it for like five months straight solo across the ocean that's a pretty big leap so <laughs> where did you even get that idea let alone commit to it well if you ever had that sense that it's not so much that you have the idea but the idea has you mm -hmm. you know like yeah. the idea was wandering around trying to find some victim yeah. to pick on <laughs> yeah. yeah so i was <laughs> yeah Yes, you're sort of free at the moment. Yeah. Yes, do. <laughs> so I'd come back from Peru in 2003, and then I spent like six months writing the book about that experience. And um, in part of processing uh, what had happened in Peru, I'd really started to get switched on to environmentalism and sustainability or lack of sustainability more specifically yeah um i'd been on this pilgrimage up into the andes and um the other pilgrims had told me that every year they have to trek a bit further to get to the glacier because it's getting smaller and smaller and i was like well what's with this and so i think we forget sometimes how much more mainstream um climate change has become especially since 2006 and an inconvenient truth right and this was back in 2003 so I started reading about climate change about deforestation about ocean acidification about all of these things and I was just like 
horrified. I, you know, I desperately wanted to do something um, really with all the zeal of the convert. And I was trying to find what was I uniquely suited to do that would tick these two main boxes. There are a lot of sub boxes as well, but the two main ones were um, a mission to raise environmental awareness. And the other one was how can I further stretch my boundaries as a human being and find out what I'm capable of? So I'd been sitting with these questions for months. Yeah, I was just so frustrated. I couldn't think of what I could do to really support the cause. And then one day I was just driving and, you know, your brain waves sort of go into a certain place. Yeah. And I think your conscious mind sort of shuts up. And your subconscious can get a word in edgeways. So I don't, I think where this idea came from depends on your worldview, whether it was from the subconscious, Mm -hmm. whether it's from spirit. Um, I I just don't know. But this crazy idea pops into my head. Like I was vaguely aware that there were a few crazy people out there who rode across oceans, but it had not struck me as something appealing. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But so, yeah, this idea just came in. why don't you row across oceans and use your adventures as your platform to get people's attention? Mm. And then through your blogs and your talks and your books, you can raise awareness and hopefully inspire some action on our environmental issues. So my first reaction was, oh, yeah, that's it. That's what I've been looking for. And then the second reaction was, oh, my God, that's completely insane. Like, and terrifying. I've never really... <laughs> I've been on a cross-channel ferry to France, but you know this is this is rather outside my realm of expertise. Yeah. And so, what so was? For, oh, go ahead. For about a week, there was just this debate. Like the heart was going hell yeah, and the mm-hmm. head was going, oh, this is a really a terribly bad idea. You know how your brain, its job is to keep you safe. Totally. And it think of all the reasons why you shouldn't even try this, and you can really only move forward when heart and head are in some sort of alignment. So eventually the heart managed to persuade the head that there were enough really sensible reasons that this was a very good idea. And so my first commitment was to tell my mum and um, we shouldn't go over too well, although she she ended up being like my best ever supporter. But of course she thought it was a horrible idea. Yeah, well, but, it's scary. Yeah, I think she her response was probably very rational, yeah. actually. And then, yeah, I just sat down and wrote the mother of all to-do lists that if I was going to make this happen, what would what would I need to do? And it all started to seem frighteningly doable. So before you set out, what are some of the things that you need to do to prepare? I mean, because I I read everything from, you know, the equipment getting destroyed by storms to you losing weight. So it sounds like you need to pack on pounds. You need to get the right tools. You need to stock up on the right food. Like there's so many things to consider that the average person would have no idea. So do you want to just kind of run us through a brief version of what that to-do list is? Sure. (laughs) Unfortunately, by far the easiest part for me is putting on the pounds. Like (laughs) that's not a problem. Um, So the first thing I did was um, I did actually know somebody who had rowed across the Atlantic um, with, of all people, his mother. So I phoned up Dan and I said, Dan, I am seriously thinking about, you know, rowing across three oceans, but starting with the Atlantic. So where should I start? So he told me that that was an ocean rowers weekend. Who knew um, that was going to luckily be taking place a couple of weeks later down in Devon in southwest England. So um, I headed down there. I met, I think at that point, there were about 200 people in the world had rowed across an ocean. And I think about 100 of them were there. So I really got off to a flying start. Um, Discovered that most ocean rowers seem to drink like fish. So I came back with quite a bad hangover, but lots of (laughs) contact sales so that I could follow up with people to ask lots of questions. I re- it seems also that most ocean rowers have written a book about it, mm-hmm. um, including me now. So um, I was reading the books. I signed up for various courses in first aid, sea survival, uh, meteorology, celestial navigation, maritime communications. Uh, I was training like a maniac. Um, that sounds so cool. So fun. 
uh, the train, what, 16 hours on a rowing machine, if that's well, your idea of fun. No, not just the training, the learning. Like, I miss school when you're learning about something that you're interested in. So getting to study all these things sounds really fun. The training sounds grueling. <laughs> And when your life depends on it, you're very highly motivated to True. really do the work. And in fact, um, I'd given myself just 14 months to prepare for the Atlantic, which was really good because I had so much to do. Um, I also obviously had to acquire a boat. Yeah. And the boat that I bought was just a shell when I bought it. So I still had to get it all completely fitted out with solar panels and um, a water maker, which is a desalinator, um, whole electrical system. GPS, satellite phone, first aid kit, toolkit, all my food. Um, you know, there was a lot to do in 14 months. But um, thankfully, that spared me from having too much time to really stop and think about whether this was a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> I found that whenever I did stop and think, like those voices would come back going, you're a complete idiot. Yeah. <laughs> This is insanity. <laughs> You're not qualified. This is insanity. Um, so it just felt a bit like, um, you know, in the cartoons where they just keep running. Yeah. And provided they don't look down, they real they um they can sort of run across thin air. <laughs> so what is in <coughs> Okay. Good. Oh. What does the inside of the boat look like? I mean, walk me through what a typical day is like, what your space is like, what you do to pass the time. You know, take us into the experience. Sure. Well, um, the boat is 23 feet long, okay. six feet wide. Um, the sleeping cabin is about the size of a, like a single bed um, or twin bed yeah. um, and it's widest but it tapers down towards the stern and you can just about sit up in it um, so the sleeping cabin takes up the stern one third okay. um, of the boat then you the middle third is the rowing deck so that's completely open to the elements and that's where I would be sitting and rowing for 12 hours a day and then the bow third of the boat that was a storage cabin and there's also lots and lots of storage underneath the decks um, so that's where I was able to keep all the food because I had to be completely self-reliant while yeah. I was out. So now take that mental image of the boat and like for 24 hours a day, it's doing this. Yeah. It never stands still. And the year that I did the Atlantic was quite possibly the worst year ever for weather conditions. So it was very rough. There were some just scary big waves that I just didn't even want to look at. It was like, just keep looking at the compass. Don't look at the wave because it's really terrifying. Um, so I would um, get up a bit before sunrise, do my first rowing shift of three hours. Um, then I'd have had like snacks throughout, but then I'd have a more substantial breakfast after the first shift. Then do another three hours, then have a one hour break for my my lunch um, when I normally, I was growing bean sprouts on board. I had a little sprouting pot so I could grow fresh, crunchy veg. Oh my gosh, so that's, that's amazing. It's very healthy. Um, and then the afternoon shift, um, and then supper. I normally try and have that at sunset because rowers face backwards and I was always rowing west. So I was always facing east, if yeah. you see what I mean. Yeah. So if I could see the sunset and, you know, when you've got no sort of entertainment at all, you grow to really appreciate the subtle things like sunrise and sunset and the stars at night. Mm. And you become very in tune with what phase of the moon it is. You feel very connected to nature. Um, very so, primal. Yeah, it is primal. Yeah, you feel it's very humbling yeah. as well because those waves are so big and so powerful. And especially when the waves are breaking your oars and everything else, you feel very um, puny, yeah. really. Yeah. At one point, they all broke oars. all of your oars, didn't they? Yeah, it was one at a time. Uh, the first one, I can't remember exactly now. I know all four of them broke before I was halfway across. Although by the time the third one out of four breaks, you know, you're already in trouble. You can't yeah. row with one oar. Yeah. So I had to just... Um, look around the boat and find things that I could use as splints. And fortunately I had lots and lots of duct tape with me, very, very useful okay. stuff. 
So I was able to sort of splint the oars and then bind them really tightly with the duct tape. And they looked pretty awful and the balance was all off, but you really just need some sticks <laughs> yeah. to keep the water. So, so I managed um, because the alternative was to get, you know, I could maybe have arranged for some oars to be brought out to me by a passing ship, right. but then then I would have lost my unsupported status. And I don't know why, it was just because I was so, like, this is my project. I'm going right. to do this all on, all on my own. Um, it was, I totally get it. It was really, um, I felt like I'd spent so much of my life depending on other people. And sometimes that made me lazy, that rather than try and figure something out for myself, I just turned to someone for advice, you know, yeah. whether that was a parent, a teacher, a boyfriend, husband, whatever. I would end up deferring to someone else and I'd never really had to stand on my own two feet. And now I was just like all about self-reliance. Yeah, you're like, I'm so, going to be resourceful. <laughs> I Exactly, exactly. I'm going to figure out my way through it. And it wasn't just the, um, wasn't just the sort of physical or technical resourcefulness. I, I found depths of psychological resourcefulness that I had never known I had because can you speak I, to that like this this yeah, pu- this aspect that. of the journey where you are alone for so many days especially in 2018 where now we're bombarded all day every day with other people on social media it's hard for me to even grasp on like a spiritual level I'm like how did she spend her time what did she think about what did she discover about herself so if you could go into that I got all day. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I did. Um, I'm sure that I can convey a lot um, in a short space of time. Because um, actually, I think this is, I think what I learned on the ocean is so relevant to life everywhere. I mean, yeah. it was in a different context, but these are the same sorts of challenges that we all face every single day. Um it was especially intense on the Atlantic because I'd planned to have musical entertainment. Um, but for the first month, there wasn't enough sunshine to generate enough electricity through my solar panels to power anything other than the absolute essentials. Yeah. And then when the sun finally came out and I was like, yay, music. Um, about two days later, the stereo stopped working and I opened it up and it was just all rusty inside. I was like, damn it yeah so I ended up spending three and a half months alone with my own thoughts which was um brutal because <laughs> um, the thoughts aren't always very friendly yeah and especially I was in pain I had tendonitis in my shoulders and pretty horrendous saltwater sores on my on my bottom and it's um I'm not one of those really stoical people like when I'm in pain, I'm miserable. Yeah. I was really glad that I was solo, actually, because I would have been the worst crewmate yeah. to be around. <laughs> I'm an only uh, child. I get it. I'm a real brat sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it's best that we go through these steep learning curves, like in privacy. Mm-hmm. I think certainly it works best for me. Um, so it was really a good day when I figured out um, a, a way to deal with myself. So I did find that if I could manage to reframe the situation in some way, it helps. So as an example of that, um, there was one day I was rowing along and I was in a very negative state of mind. Everything was hurting and everything in my cabin was damp and my oars are all broken and patched up. And I'm just like, oh, this is all so uncomfortable. I was really frustrated with how just uncomfortable everything was. And then... (laughs) like this penny dropped and I went oh hold on a minute before I started whenever anybody asked me why I was doing this one of the reasons I gave was I would rather blithely say I want to get outside my comfort zone and in this moment I go oh my god getting outside your comfort zone is by definition going to be uncomfortable so the fact that I'm so uncomfortable doesn't mean that I'm failing it actually means that I am wildly succeeding at this because I am more uncomfortable than I could ever have imagined. <laughs> so, I'm doing um, it. <laughs> I'm doing it, yay. <laughs> so it was weird that I was able to flip the discomfort from being failure into being success. Mm. Um, and uh, what would be another example? Like, how uh, did you not go crazy? <laughs> 
thank you for the assumption that I'm not crazy. Um, uh, did you talk to yourself? I did. So, well, yeah, I and to the ocean. I yeah. had a lot of serious words with the ocean. I really seriously learned why uh, sailors have a reputation for bad language because the ocean can really just annoy you like nothing else. Yeah. And, at first, so here was another thing I learned. At first, I took it really personally, especially because I've been reading all this spiritual stuff just yeah. before I set out on the ocean. I'd be like, the ocean is trying to teach me a lesson. If I could just figure out the lesson, yeah. then suddenly I, I, the wind would be behind me and the waves would all flatten out and it would all be lovely and dolphins would be dancing and, you know, mermaids <laughs> singing. And I don't know what. And... Um, eventually so you know I was driving myself crazy going what's the lesson what is the lesson I'm supposed to learn and in the end I went you know what the ocean is just obeying the laws of physics mm. it's not rearranging itself in order to teach me a lesson but actually that's what I told myself at the time so here's another thing I learned like we tell ourselves stories all the time it's to how support human whatever it is that we want to believe in that moment <laughs> Exactly, yeah. exactly. And it's easy to craft very negative stories like the ocean's being really mean to me. It's being yeah. horrible. And, you know, I, I started out being really indignant about that because I was like, nature, I'm out here because like you called me, you asked me to do this so that I could spread awareness about how we have to look after you. And you're just kicking my backside every single day. Like yeah. what's with that? So uh, my stories, should we say, were not constructive at that point. And um it probably really took me, I would say, 10 years to be, I, there was a lot of residual resentment about mm. nature having been so unkind to me. And at the time, I realized, heck, nature doesn't care. Yeah. You know, it's just doing its thing, just obeying the laws of nature. Um, and I have to do my thing, which is row. Um, but mm. then 10 years later, I actually reached a place where I could be profoundly grateful for everything that went wrong. I, the broken camping stove, the broken stereo, the broken oars, later on the broken satellite phone, um, because I'd wanted to grow as a person. And if everything had gone perfectly according to plan, nothing had broken, the weather had been beautiful, yeah. I'd had this blissful time, I would not have learned a fraction of what I learned about myself and about how to cope with really big, scary challenges. Yeah. And so it took a long time to reach that sort of philosophical and Zen attitude about it all. But I really did reach that phase, being able to see that those things didn't happen to me, they happened for me. Totally. And I, I emerged from that as a much, much stronger person, having been pushed so many times beyond where I thought my limits were. What was the scariest moment for you? Um, well, or the first night was them. pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just because uh, I was being seasick and it was so rough and the waves sounded so loud as they crashed around the sleeping cabin. And I, it was very dark and I felt so alone. Mm. And at the same time, I felt like a complete prize idiot because I was like, oh, my God, whatever made me think that I could do this? <laughs> um, but, you know, I can't back out now. I've invested my life savings into it. Yeah. Um, not to do it. Um, but probably uh, my first attempt on the Pacific didn't go very well. Um, I got 10 days out, ran into a big storm. The boat was capsizing and it's designed to self-right if it mm -hmm. capsizes. But it was sort of capsizing more than it should have been. And I had a bit of a knock to the head. But actually, that wasn't really the scary bit. Um I would probably have carried on, but the situation or the decision was taken out of my hands when somebody reading my blog became concerned about me and rather patronizingly, I thought, um, although I'm sure he thought he was being gallant, Helpful, yeah. um, he called out the US Coast Guard to come and pick me up. So um, I ended up being airlifted into the back of a helicopter, which is not fun because they can't pick you up off the deck. So like they're in the helicopter over me. And we're on the radio and they're saying, when we say the word, you have to jump in the water and swim over to the guy on the end of the line. And, you know, 
I feel bad saying this because obviously, like the guy on the end of the line is also not in an entirely happy situation. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's pretty scary when you're jumping into 25 foot waves. Suddenly, your boat, even though it's capsizing, starts to look really appealing. Yeah. That much fun. But probably the closest I came to actually dying was um, it was right towards the end of the Pacific. So I was just coming into Papua New Guinea. And um, stupidly, I, I accidentally dropped my boat hook overboard. I'd been using it to prop up my sun canopy. I didn't need the boat hook. I had another one, but I've been doing all this campaigning around plastic pollution in the oceans. So I was like, you know, I can't go around littering the oceans after yeah. I banging on about this for so long so yeah I take off my sun hat and my gloves and my iPod and um, I jump in and swim back to fetch it and pick it up and then realize when I turn around to see where the boat is as I've been swimming in that direction my boat's been drifting in that direction and now I'm quite a long way away from it so I try swimming back with this four foot pole in my hand and obviously that's not going very well so I realized I'm going to have to abandon the boat hook. Yeah. But um, by then I'm quite tired. And it's like one of those nightmares where, you know, you're running or you're swimming and you're trying to get to somewhere and you just feel like you're, you're, you're going, not nowhere. going nowhere. Yeah. And I was really starting to think, is this it? Is this how it ends? And um, honestly, what, what helped me find that extra kick of speed that I needed was... Um, thinking about my poor, long-suffering mother. And um, the previous year, she'd had a horrible dream in which um, they'd found my boat at sea with nobody on board, and she knew I must have drowned. And when she told me about this nightmare, I'd said, Mum, I promise you, I will not get separated from my boat. <laughs> so as I'm there in the water, like, getting separated from my boat. Yeah. I'm like, I cannot let this happen. Um, I just can't do that to my mum and somehow managed to find the bit of extra speed that I needed to catch up with the boat. So, I mean, that was ridiculous. It was a beautiful, calm day. Nothing particularly dangerous happening. It was my own stupid fault. The 25-foot waves sound out of this world. Like, I can't imagine how much fear I would have inside me if I'm in, you know, I've, I've seen pictures of your boat. This thing just sitting on the surface of the ocean, and the ocean's doing this. Yeah, I... um. I find it amazing, actually, how adaptable humans are. I mean, the first two weeks were really scary. Um, but it's surprising how quickly we adapt to a new normal. I mm -hmm. think we really underestimate. Well, actually, even the research mm -hmm. into um, levels of happiness, there was this famous study that took lottery winners and people who just had a back injury and become quadriplegic. Yeah. So, of course, we think one situation amazing, one situation catastrophic. But actually, and immediately afterwards, yeah, the lottery winners are happy and the quadriplegics not so much. But six months later, they tended very much to have returned to their status quo. Their baseline, quote, yeah. Their baseline level of happiness. And, you know, it's, it's that adaptation. Uh, and I think often we we're fearful about new situations yeah. because before we're in the situation, it looks scary. But I think once we actually get there, um, we get used to it. I mean, human beings have always adapted to new situations. I know environmentally now we're really like pushing the limits of what we can adapt to, but um, it's just given me a lot more courage about going into unknown situations, knowing that what seems scary at first the longer I'm there or the more times I do the scary thing, um, the less scary it becomes. So I've really, I've learned a lot, um, particularly about courage, actually. I was teaching this class at Yale last year on courage. So I was really thinking about it a lot to teach, you know, 13 yeah. weeks. And um, one of the most important things that I really wanted my students to take away from it was yeah, I used to think that you had to be a certain kind of a person to go have a big adventure or, you know, to start a business or to do anything else that might seem a little intimidating. Right. Um, and I thought I was not that kind of a person. I thought you had to have the courage first and then... It makes you courageous. You would, then you would be able to take the actions. But actually, it's the taking the actions that then unleash the courage. Yeah. So then you think, well, but how do I find the courage to do the action in the first place? And 
my interpretation of that is you just get really, really motivated around something. A positive motivation, like I really want to be an adventurer, or I really want to do my bit to um, help make the world a more sustainable place. Um, or it's a negative thing, like I really, really don't want to be a management consultant yeah, anymore. Yeah, you know, leverage. You just, or all of the above. Um, yeah. And certainly on my way across three oceans, I had to use every motivation that I could think of. Um, and different ones worked on different days. But I really think it's finding that that motivation in the first place that yeah. um, helps you overcome the fear and do the thing anyway. But if you if you wait to not feel scared, then you'll be waiting a very long time. Forever. Yeah. What was Forever. the biggest surprise or the biggest because <clears throat> obviously you have your expectations going into each voyage about what it's going to be like, especially the later ones, because you'd already done, you know, some of this yeah. in the past. What were things that stood out to you that you never would have expected? Um, this might sound awful, but uh, sort of myself. Mm-hmm. I was like, wow, I managed to do that. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. Um, I, if, you'd have, if we'd been having this conversation 20 years ago, um, which was before I'd quit my job and really started this whole process, um, I was really such a different person. My self-esteem was like completely down the toilet. Mm. Um, I was um, <clears throat> I was unhappy, and I think when you're unhappy, you often, often become very sort of um, self-absorbed, and not not in an introspective way, just in a sort of negative energy sucking kind of a way. Totally. Um, so I was unhappy. I was unconfident, um, and I was kind of lost. I just didn't know where I wanted to go in life and just wasn't really getting the hang of things at all. And um, now I look back and it feels so much better to be me now than it did then. And I know it's, for me personally, this was the path that I had to take. And, you know, everyone's got a different path. And I'm certainly, I'm not saying my path would work for everybody. I'm definitely not saying everyone should go row oceans although you know it's a really good way to get to know yourself yeah um but I'm I'm glad that I listened to that little voice inside me that was saying like there is something here that you're here to do yeah um there is something more that you have to offer and yes it's going to take work and it for me it has done I you know I've really I've read and I've thought and I've had wonderful conversations and um you know as I've progressed along that path I've learned to really love it and my life is so different now I um not only do I feel happier to be me but maybe because of that I've got the most awesome group of friends I really have I feel so lucky and um I was curious how your life has evolved so please feel free to elaborate on that um I suppose um, in many ways it's kind of law of attraction that when you just start um, finding ways to focus on the positive and then you start to feel grateful for the new good things that are coming in, you start creating this virtuous cycle where just more and more good stuff comes in. Yeah, and you Um, being lit up attracts other people who are lit up and... Absolutely. And, you know, when I when I left my marriage, I was terrified because yeah. all my friends at that point, we were all like married, mortgaged, all sort of management consultancy type people. I think maybe I knew one divorced person and that was about I just didn't know what the world outside of my bubble looked yeah. like. And then when I sort of not only got outside the bubble, I pretty much burst it. Um, I found out, oh, wow, this is where all the cool kids are hanging out. <laughs> not no disrespect to my old friends at all but I, no, just, I get what you're saying a lot of really interesting new people came into my life that really made me feel very supported and helped me to feel that I was on the right track well, it's um, like living inside the box of what you've always been told life should be and then getting outside of it and there's all of this space you know it, it's endless oh and... you just said it so well yeah absolutely and now I sort of think of it like um, my, 
my old life looks sort of monochrome mm -hmm. um, and my new life feels so much more technicolor um, so yeah I I get amazing opportunities and I suppose having spent those seven years uh, so that was one like the the first voyage across the Atlantic and then the failed attempt on the Pacific mm -hmm. and then three years doing the three successful stages and then the Indian Ocean was the last one in 2011 which as you mentioned earlier was the five months alone at sea um, those seven years have um, like given me inner resources but also it's sort of given me a calling card now I've mm -hmm. got curiosity value so yes I get invited to teach at Yale I get invited to speak at ocean conferences I get to speak at women's conferences um, I I write you know I blog every week I um one of the and questions this year, oh please ooh. keep going <laughs> can I just quickly I'll touch on this because I also I desperately don't want to run out of time although thank you you're asking such lovely questions as well you're really um thanks for giving me such a lovely chance to share oh, um so what I'm really super excited about this year I think it's a really cool time to be a woman and um this year, my main project is to launch a global women's network um, called The Sisters. And it was inspired oh, by a gathering. <laughs> oh, it's going to get chillier. Um, <laughs> <coughs> Last year, I had a gathering of 35 of my most awesome girlfriends, um, rented a, a nice country house, and you know, we were all sharing bedrooms. It was like a cross between a conference and a big sleepover. Yeah had such interesting conversations and such energy was generated and we really wanted to see how we could harness or sort of take that that feminine creative energy and share it more widely so um planning to launch in september um if everything comes together in time and i think especially like the me too movement it's important. It feels like this venting of not just one generation, but probably millennia of anger and fury at the way that women have been treated for mm -hmm. so long. But then there needs to be the positive vision to come in behind that. Now we've said what we don't want. What do we want? Because, you know, Occupy to some extent sort of fizzled. Having said we hate capitalism, it didn't really present a viable alternative so it's that positive vision of how do we create a world in balance yeah. a balance of masculine and feminine of humans with the other parts of nature and of present needs with future needs and so that's what I get really excited about at the moment and I'm very fortunate in that with my travels and other opportunities I've already got quite a global network of um, sure so I'm going to be like reaching out and asking people to help me spread the word about that. And what will that look like? Is it taking form as a conference, as different satellite events, as an online community? What's the vision there? So um, there are two main parts to it. Um, there will be an online magazine, which will be completely refreshed every quarter. Um, so there'll be articles there. I really want like personal stories. I don't want listicles of, you know, Yep. three things amazing women do before breakfast um but really especially stories of transformation whether that's individual whether that's in teams and communities whether that's visions of how the world needs to change um but very personal and it's also very important to me that a woman no matter where she comes from in the world can come to the website and find people that she can relate to mm -hmm. no matter what uh nationality or her religion or her color or her orientation or whatever yeah, yeah. um then the other part of it is um going to be this gets a bit more complicated but i really want to make this work is to bind women together into small groups so the co-coaching pairs which i've done at various times with girlfriends where we alternate coaching each other yeah or a mastermind four, yep. where four of us hop on a call and one woman is in the hot seat each week, or something more like what we did for my birthday celebration last year, bringing together 30 or so women to have a, a sort of intensive. Um, but also to give women the opportunity to choose about whether they want to build their network locally or globally. Mm. And also they can change that, they could change their preferences on that. So it might be that for a while they want to go local and then they go, hey, you know what, I really feel like I'd like to connect with 
like-minded women in other countries. Yeah. Your so, birthday celebration sounds like my dream. I'm a former community manager, so like bringing to people together, being like, you should talk to this person, they know this, or you guys would bond over that. It's just, uh, and the sleepover aspect, it sounds so fun. It was absolutely awesome. Yeah, really, um, I do recommend that. You know, I, maybe one of the things that I'll do is I could sort of put together a template and, you know, you don't have to, you know, rent a country house. You can, but sort of, we're doing, like a we're doing idea. a smaller version <laughs> next month, actually, in California. And we're just all going to be at someone's home. And yeah, we're yeah. going to be squished into beds and sleeping in trailers outside and someone's bringing her camper van. Um, so it's very much that sisters, like we're all family together. We're all yeah. sharing and bucking in and helping and collaborating and co-creating. And it was one of those, I couldn't have given myself a better birthday gift. And it still gives me such joy now that I'm seeing the friendships that were forged, yeah. like women creating business opportunities for each other, or just, you know, meeting up or um, planning trips together. And um, we get together on a call once a month. Um, How many of many you are there? There are 35, well, there's kind of 35 who were there last year. Then there's another 15 or so who couldn't actually be there in person last year, but are still part of that sister's community. Yeah. And given the time zones and people's work and family commitments, we get sort of between 12 and 16 on a call usually. And um, it's it just always leaves me feeling supercharged and energized and happy, yeah. like really joyful afterwards and I think that there's something special when you when you bring together women who care about the future women who want to make the world a better place there's something I mean I don't understand enough about the energy I just know that it there's feels something there. it feels really good yeah and um I'm sure it's going to be a steep learning curve. I've never done anything quite like this before. But as with so many things I've done, um, I'm at that happy, how hard can it be? Yeah, yeah, kind yeah. <laughs> and it'll probably be driving me insane about a year from now. Um, but, you know, it's all a learning experience. And something that I've got much better with is like failure. I don't really see things as binary successes or failures anymore I see everything as a learning opportunity exactly. and I'm sure that I will screw up spectacularly at several things um, hopefully in a really short space of time so that I can learn fast and correct and move forward so um, I wish well, that I'd understood amazing. this earlier that um, yeah if, if we just keep doing the things that look like su success and get us a pat on the back then we we end up not really determining the courses of our own lives. We end up just, uh, you know, following the, yeah. the rounds of following applause. Following the scripts the... of others. Exactly, exactly. Where I suppose I should use the maritime metaphor of rather than charting our own course <laughs> and, um, yeah, that's our own destination. So, um, It's fitting. Well, we yeah. only have a couple minutes left. Um, <laughs> But I do have a couple questions that I ask at the end of every episode. Yeah. Okay. I, may, I might just ask one for time and then a couple rapid fire questions. So rapid fire real quick. Break it on. What made you laugh while you were on your voyages? Laughter is like so important to me. And if I was alone for five months, I think it'd be really hard. So what kept you laughing? Oh, my own stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Um, or listening to the soundtrack from Life of Brian. Mm, I like it. What was your favorite Lara bar? Ooh, such a difficult one. Uh, <laughs> um, let's go with the um, ooh, different ones for different times of day. Banana. Banana, okay. And uh, what was the, the coolest animal or nature experience that you remember? closer on the thing between the whale shark and the turtle mm. loved both yeah it's gonna have to be a dead heat between those two and who is someone that is like a mentor to you or someone that inspires you now my amazing friend ellen who unfortunately for me lives in california and i live in the uk mm. um, but she is one of those amazing friends who 
doesn't see me as I was, doesn't see me as my, I am, but sees me as who I could be. Mm, I love that. And also, I'd really like to mention my mother, who, with her stick to itiveness, like she's just really good at getting over the emotional stuff and just getting on with what needs to be done. Mm, I like that. And so, on the days when I'm having the, oh, but I don't feel like yeah. it kind of thing, I think. I you channel, channel my her. Mother. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to start channeling her. <laughs> and then the last question, uh, what does being bold mean to you or leading a bold life? It means that although I still have that little voice in my head that tells me why this can't possibly work and why I'm not good enough. And I've learned to say, thank you, voice. I know you're trying to pr- protect me from embarrassment, but I'm fine. There are worse things than embarrassment. I'm going to go ahead and do this thing anyway. Yeah. I love it. Doing it anyway. <laughs> Feel the fear and do it anyway. Yeah, yeah. I know it's so corny, but if only I'd have. Anyway, I, I wouldn't wish anything differently because I think I had to build up a big enough head of steam in my old life mm-hmm. to like then, this is mixing my metaphors, but to then like catapult me. Yeah. <laughs> doing something as extreme as rowing alone across three oceans so uh, there is nothing that I would change at all Mm. and everything in my life I've learned by doing it the wrong way first so I'm very forgiving of my past uh, learning experiences well we'll definitely have links to the books to your website so people can get more information about you and follow along with the sisters is that what it's called the sisters it is yes it's not um it's not online yet, but if people would be kind enough to sign up to my newsletter, um, there'll be one of those annoying little pop-up boxes when they go to my website. Um, <laughs> then they will be the first to know when awesome. we go live. Yay. Well, thank you, Raz. It was so nice oh, getting to know you. you. I've really enjoyed it, Kimberly. Thanks for the awesome work that you're doing. And yeah, keep making the world a better place. Thank you so much to Roz for coming on today's show. And thank you for listening. Was she not one of the coolest women you've ever heard in your entire life? I just want her to be my best friend and be completely honest with you. (laughs) Well, if you'd like more access to the show notes, head to theboldlifemovement.com slash 076. And if you loved today's episode, please head over to Instagram, drop me a comment. I love getting your DMs. You can find me at the bold life movement. Thank you so much again for listening. As always, be bold, be you, and I will catch you next time.